There's something wrong. I don't know. Oh, is it? Okay. So. So the, the last talk of the session is uh, essentially optimal robust secret, sh secret sharing with maximal corruption by Alison Bishop, Valerio Pastro, Ramo and Ryan Moran, and Daniel Vich. And Valerio will give the talk. Thanks for the intro. So I'll talk about uh, robust secret sharing against as many corrupt players as possible. So what is a secret sharing scheme? I'm going to talk about threshold secret sharing. A secret sharing scheme is a couple of algorithms. One algorithm, the sharing algorithm, takes a secret and outputs a bunch of shares. Another algorithm, the reconstruction algorithm, takes the shares and reconstructs the secret. We want two properties. One of them is key privacy, meaning that uh, any set of uh, T shares reveals no information about the secret. And we also want t plus one reconstruction, meaning that as soon as, as long as you add uh, one share, you get the secret back, meaning t plus one shares completely define the secret. So the textbook example is Shamir secret sharing. In order to share, you just sample a uniform polynomial of degree t, which evaluates to the secret at the origin and the shares are nothing but the evaluations of those polynomials at public points. In order to reconstruct, you can do polynomial interpolation or read Solomon decoding. Um, what about robust secret sharing? So just add the extra property that I'm going to describe now. Suppose that T shares are selected by an adversary who can then corrupt them arbitrarily. Um, even in this scenario, we want the reconstruction to be correct up to some uh, error probability. So what is known about robust secret sharing? So let's say that k is the security parameter, so that error delta is 2 to the minus k. Uh, the secret size is m, and n is the number of players. So here I'm going to plot the share size against the number of corruptions. So it is known that with this honest majority, you can have robust secret sharing. So more than half of corruptions, it's not possible. Since we have a threshold structure, it is not possible to have a share size smaller than secret size. If you think about it, 
the threshold property tells you that T shares give no information about the secret, but if you add one, that one share will completely determine the secret. So that one share has to be as big as the secret at least. Positive results, we have that Shamir becomes a robust secret sharing when the number of errors, uh, when the number of corruptions is small enough, because you can think about it as a Reed-Solomon encoding, and su it supports up to a third of errors. So what happens here? There is another positive result by Robin Benor. Uh, this result is for the case of maximal corruptions. It also expands to fewer corruptions, but I'll just focus on this. And it has uh, overhead k times n in terms of the share size. Another, uh, okay, uh, a negative result is a lower bound uh, that says that in the case of maximal corruptions, you have to have a over, an overhead of at least security parameter. Another positive result by Sevalos, Fer, and others, uh, it's an elegant refinement of Robin Benoit that um, shrinks the overhead to um, OK plus N. So here, what happens is this. You can combine a ramp secret sharing by Cromer, Dangor, and others with Shamir, and you can get a robust secret sharing for a constant number of corruptions, uh, sorry, constant fraction of corruptions that achieves essentially optimal uh, share size. And the only thing left is this. So what we do is essentially fill the gap and we have a scheme that achieves or till decay um, overhead. Okay, so I'm gonna focus a little bit on the Rabin Benoit scheme just to give you an idea of how it works and then move to our scheme. So the Rabin Benoit scheme uses two building blocks. Shamir secret sharing to achieve privacy and mes mes message authentication codes to achieve robustness. So Okay, here, just a notational thing. Um, if I have a key and you have a message tag pair that authenticates with my key, I'm gonna draw a green arrow between me and you. If your message tag pair is invalid with my key, I'm gonna draw a red arrow. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Uh, so as I said, Robin Benoit, it uses Shamir first, and then this is what happens for authentication. Let's focus on two players, I and J. Let's sample a key, uh, Z, J, I, for player J, and we give uh, player I a tag via this key on this share. It means that player J authenticates player I's share. So we do this for all J and for all I. Um, okay, so this is how you share. How do you reconstruct? Um, so uh, there's gonna be three types of players. Honest players, uh, there are T plus one of them. Uh, they don't touch their shares, so they're exactly how the dealer uh, defined them. And then the corrupt players are split into two. Uh, there are players who don't touch their Shamir, sh uh, Shamir share, and those who instead uh, corrupt it. So let's see how the authentication graph is colored. Edges from honest players to honest players are all green. Of course. Uh, so if I'm an honest guy, I'll have at least T income in good edges. Uh, if I'm one of the red players, which I call active, well, all the honest guys are gonna accuse me. So I'll have at most T minus one income in good edges, namely the ones that come from my other uh, corrupt friends. If I'm the last type of, of player, which I call passive, 
well, I'll get at least uh, t incoming good edges because my Shamir share is valid. So one way you can reconstruct is, well, let's find a subset of H union P and use the Shamir portion to reconstruct. So if you can identify H union P, you're in good shape. So how do you do that? Think about it as a graph game. You're given a graph with this coloring rules, and you need to find H union P. One way to do that is just select those players that have at least T incoming good edges. That's it. So the high level idea is Shamir secret sharing gives you privacy, and then the authentication graphs gives you um, robustness, and essentially you're compiling this into a graph game. In order to reconstruct, you solve the graph game and retrieve H in MP, and then use standard Shamir to reconstruct <laughs> the secret. Uh, we're going to use the si the similar, uh, a similar approach for our scheme. And in this talk, I'll just talk about how to recover H union P from the graph. There is a lot in the paper about how to define the graph. So please read the paper. Um, good. So how does this graph interact with the overhead? In the Robin Benor case, the graph is complete and the max are long. Long max means that the, the overhead depends linearly on K. And the complete graph means that the overhead depends linearly on n, because each vertex stores n edges. In uh, the refinement by Savalos and others, they managed to shrink the overhead by having short max. The graph is still complete, so you see this n here. So what do we do? We use a sparse graph and also short max. So OK. What's our graph game? So it looks like this. The dealer samples a uh, graph, and the adversary ad adaptively corrupts and decides which of the parties are uh, active and passive. And then he has the ability to change the outgoing edges from the active players arbitrarily. We call this property zero. What about the coloring properties? Um, honest and passive uh, guys authenticate each other. Honest guys accuse active guys. Active guys accuse honest guys. And notice that the edges that are going from H are hidden to the adversary. So that's another interesting and important property. Okay, so let's play the game and retrieve H union P. Um, so, okay, I'm the adversary. I'm corrupting T players, deciding, you know, these are active, these are passive. So property zero tells me I can change the active, uh, the outgoing edges from the active players, so I'll do that. Then the coloring properties kick in, so honest and passive um, authenticate each other. Uh, honest accuse active, active accuse honest, and everything else that you see Black can be colored arbitrarily. So how do I recover H union P? Well, it turns out that H union P with this setting is the largest self-consistent set. Self-consistent meaning players in this set auth only authenticate each other. So essentially we have a reconstruction uh, algorithm more or less, but let's see why that's the case. So property one tells me that honest and passive, the set of honest and passive guys is self-consistent. So that's, that's promising. What about other sets that are as large? Well, they must contain some active guys and some honest guys. So, and the, prob the probability that the set is self-consistent is bounded by the probability that the honest component of the set is disconnected from the active component of that set by property two. Um, you can evaluate that probability by using the uniformity of the honest 
edges. And that, this number here is a very low quantity that survives a union bound. So H union P is very likely the largest self-consistent set. Good. So we just solved the problem essentially, but the algorithm to find the max self-consistent set may be inefficient. So how do you make it efficient? Um, so the way we do it is just by essentially having a very short list of candidate sets. And the way we achieve this short list is by using two algorithms that I call budget and bisection. The budget algorithm is effective if the number of passive players is large. The bisection algorithm is effective in the complement case when the, the number of passive players is small. So very high level idea about how to prune in the case of large P. We define a budget of possible accusations for the active players by just rejecting everybody who complains too much. Um, then since A is small, we have that active players are accused by more than a half of their incoming edges. This is because there are more than a half honest players. And conversely, if you are an, act, uh, an honest player, you don't get many accusations because there are not too many active players. So, well, this is an average, by the way. And you can define a quantity that stays in between these two and use the gap to just kill everybody who's above this threshold. So if you're accused too much, you're out. And this is more or less how the scheme works in the budget um, algorithm. What about in the other case when there are uh, just a small number of passive players? So this is uh, very interesting, I think. We just forget about bad edges, <laughs> first of all. And, um, and then notice that the cut, honest players and corrupt players, has just a few cross edges. This is by property two and three. Um, so you could find an algorithm that bisects the graph into two sets of about the same size. And there is an actual algorithm by Reke uh, that has a logarithmic amount of cross edges more than the minimal cut for sets of these size. This means that, well, since we have this property, we know that the number of minimum times log n is bounded by this. And this can be set up to be a constant fraction. This means that essentially one of these two sets is very honest. And it turns out that it's honest enough that there is a simple method to expand it to the whole set of honest union p. So essentially, we are almost done. So if you have the five properties that I told you at the beginning, you just run the budget and the bisection algorithm in parallel, get the full list of candidate sets, pick the max self-consistent set, and use Shamir to reconstruct from the Shamir portion. And um, so this turns out to be essentially what we do for the graph part. There are tons of other questions that you may ask. For example, how to define the graph? And we, the way we do it is by using list decoding, universal hashing, and private max. In a, I, would, I would say list decoding and universal hashing are used to define something that is called robust uh, distributed storage that uh, really helps you for defining the graph in a, in a robust way. Um, what's the size of the shares in this instantiation? If you do it naively, it turns out to be um, with an overhead of k squared. But this can be uh, optimized to be OK by just parallel repetition with lower security. So um, yeah, that's, I, I would say, pretty much it. So thanks.
we have time for questions. Uh, is this in the model uh, adaptive or is it just static? It's adaptive. Um, if you settle for a non-efficient reconstruction, is there a way to get rid of the field? To get rid of the? Of the polylog factors, uh, depending on K. Um, Not that I am aware of, yeah. Any other question? No questions? Uh, you're using a random graph in order to do your analysis. I have a gut feeling that if you use a constant degree expander, uh, it might be a good substitute for the random graph and it might give you some advantages. Have you considered looking at expander graphs? Um, yeah, I think, so we looked into them, but I think uh, the properties are more or less the same for us, so it, it doesn't quite give you an advantage. I would say it's, uh, yeah, <coughs> if you pick a random graph, it's fine. and. I think probably an expander works. Most well. random graphs are expanders, yeah. but uh, the expanders might give you something provable, whereas in your case, there is a certain probability that uh, your construction will not work. Uh, you, you had some probability of uh, error if you choose a random graph which has uh, bad properties. And that's the main advantage I would like to have from the expander. Guaranteed so expansion property. But the graph can't be public, so there has to be some randomization. You, you'll have to choose uh, from a sufficiently large collection yeah. of possible okay. expanders uh, the one you want. Yeah. Then each one of them will have uh, some good properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably a good point, yes. Yeah. Okay, so le let's find the, the speaker again. So this concludes the, the session, and now there are some uh, announcements. Yes, wait before you leave, please. So it is a quick announcement uh, for the RAM session. RAM session is taking place today. This is your wonderful RAM session chair, together with me this year. Um, the RAM session will take place in this building. There is, uh, as uh, was announced yesterday, a, a small shift of, of time because of the ICR board meeting, so please check on the, on the website when exactly everything will take place. What is a RAM session? A RAM session is about flash talks. Everybody can submit its own talk, so we have a submission system open. Please do submit your contribution. Uh, flash talks means it's about two to three minutes. There is some constraints that are advertised on the website, so please check the details there. It should be, it can be scientific. It doesn't have to be scientific. Important is that it's entertaining to everybody. Uh, as I said, there's a, top, a couple of uh, time constraints. Check the website for this. And there's also some technical constraints. So uh, have a look and come tonight. Thank you. <laughs>